This is the Blood Bank Guy Essentials Podcast, Episode 104. This is the Blood Bank Guy Essentials Podcast, Episode 104. Hey everybody, welcome back to Blood Bank Guy Essentials, the podcast that is designed to teach you the essentials of transfusion medicine. My name is Joe Chaffin, and I am your host. It is very good to be back with you. Some of you may have noticed it has been a while since my last episode. There are reasons for that. Um, Frankly, a lot of them are very personal, and I'm going to keep them to myself. That's okay. For those of you who have written to me, I greatly appreciate your concern. Um, All is well. A lot happening, and we'll just leave it there. Today, I have an incredible episode for you that I'm very excited for you to hear with Dr. Brian Adkins from UT Southwestern Medical Center. Uh, But before we get to that, you should be aware that this is not a continuing education episode. You can find other episodes where you can still get free CE hours at bbguy.org slash podcast, as well as at wileyhealthlearning.com slash transfusion news. The CE episodes are courtesy of transfusionnews.com, and Transfusion News is sponsored by Griffles, who has no editorial input into this podcast. So over the years, I've received lots of questions about lots of topics through my website, bbguy.org. And by the way, if you have questions about anything, you're more than welcome to email me there. Just go to the link, uh, bbguy.org slash ask. I see every single email that people send. I'm not always able to answer everyone simply because I get a lot of them. But one of the questions that I've received a lot of interest in over the years, and it's something that I think has been somewhat confusing to people, is the the concept of how we support patients who are undergoing hematopoietic progenitor cell transplants, or as other people call it, hematopoietic stem cell transplants. Stem cell transplant can really be confusing for learners in transfusion medicine. Those patients get lots of transfusions, and there's lots of uncertainty about how long they get transfused, what products that they should get transfused, what modifications need to happen to either the transfused products or even to the actual stem cell product. Um, and, and the craziest one is the, are the issue of what blood type they get when they get an out of group uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplant. So, so all of that is something that I wanted to cover with you. And I wanted to get an expert to talk to you about it. And Dr. Brian Adkins is definitely that. I mentioned before, Brian is at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center, where he's an assistant professor of pathology. And he's also the medical director of transfusion and tissue services at Children's Health Dallas. You can read a lot more about Brian at the show page for this episode, which is bbguide.org slash 104. But also at bbguide.org slash 104, I strongly encourage you to get an article that Brian and his co-authors wrote uh, that is linked there. It's called Transfusion Support in Hematopoietic Stem Cell Transplantation, a Contemporary Narrative Review. That is in the journal Clinical Hematology International, which is linked, as I said, at the show page. As far as I know, it's open access. Any learner in blood banking should definitely have that article in their arsenal. Anyway, today in this interview, Brian walks us through the essentials of transfusion support and product management and all the stuff that we need to do with stem cell products, as well as how we manage the the patients that get out of ABO group transplants. Especially if you've been confused, I think this is going to be a very enlightening episode for you. So I will check back with you at the end. But for now, here's my interview with Dr. Brian Atkins on the essentials of transfusion support in HPC transplant. Brian, welcome to the Blood Bank Guy Essentials Podcast. Joe, great to see you. Thanks for having me. It is my pleasure. And I am, I'm really just so excited to talk about what we're going to hit today, simply because I get a lot of questions about this whole process. I get a whole lot of questions about how things work in terms of transplantation from residents, from people that are starting in transfusion services, from people that are more experienced in transfusion services. I'm a little curious though, Brian, I've seen a lot of the stuff that you've published over the years and you've been prolific. And some of the stuff that I've seen recently from you in terms of looking at red cell alloantibody discussions in pregnancy, for example, I mean, that's, that's cool stuff. The stuff that we're talking about today in terms of transplant, how did that come across your radar as something that you were interested in publishing on? Because you've done a bunch. Mm-hmm. I was really interested in ABO typing, which may sound a bit simplistic, but (laughs) ABO discrepancies that you'd see in minor incompatibility transplants and sort of coming from the immunohematology side to look at the more clinical side of things. But 
I am a pathologist at heart, so that's yeah. sort of what drove me. <laughs> and is it a big part of your daily practice? Um, so it's becoming a bigger part of my daily practice. We're uh, working on a cell therapy lab down here uh, for mm -hmm. the Children's Hospital, so doing a lot of reading and preparing for that. It was a bigger part of my practice back in residency and fellowship, and it's mm -hmm. becoming a bigger part of my practice again. Very nice. Very nice. Well, that's cool. I think let's just dive in and just kind of big picture this at first for those who are a little bit less experienced and in particular pathology residents who may not deal with this all the time. Can you just give us a big picture overview of the transplant process kind of from start to finish? And we'll delve into the specific areas, but just big picture from start to finish. How does this process go for most patients? Definitely. So stem cell transplantation is performed when there's some sort of disorder going on with the patient wherein you need to replace their hematopoietic stem cells. Ultimately, though, it can either be a stem cell based disorder. So these are like inborn errors or something acquired later in life, like AML or MDS, mm -hmm. acute bile le leukemia, myelodysplastic syndrome. Or mm -hmm. it can be a situation where you need to give someone a myeloblative chemotherapy for a condition like a solid tumor, like a testicular germ cell tumor, or for a lymphoid derived process like multiple myeloma and then rescuing with stem cells. And in those situations, you can actually do autologous stem cell transplant. So from the point at which someone decides this person is a candidate for mm -hmm. a stem cell transplant, how, how do we proceed again, just kind of generally speaking? Yeah, definitely. So I, I've already talked about auto and allos. So that's right. the first big branch. So we have uh -huh. to decide if someone needs an autologous transplant, meaning they just need the chemotherapy and the salvage with the stem cells. Or mm -hmm. if we have to start fresh with brand new stem cells for someone. Got it. And then allogeneic transplant. Mm -hmm. After that, um, you have to get a donor. So that's much easier for an autologous transplant. <laughs> They're sitting that right makes there in the clinic <laughs> versus an allogeneic transplant where you have to identify someone who's a good HLA match. Mm -hmm. Then you have to collect the graft. There's a lot of different ways you can do that. Generally, we do it by apheresis, a peripheral blood collection. However, you can also do it by bone marrow or you can get umbilical cord grafts. Okay. And then subsequent to that, there's the cell ther therapy side where we're preparing the graft and getting it ready for the patient. There's the transplanter side where the patient's getting chemotherapy, whole, whole body irradiation or reduced intensity chemotherapy. And then after that, there's the infusion of the graft. And then after infusion, you'll have the bone marrow and graft and you'll start to mm -hmm. see your cell lines coming back. You will see white cells then platelets and red cells typically, or as I like to remember it, NPR, neutrophils, platelets and red cells. Nice. And you sort of take things from there. Okay, cool. And obviously there are details that we'll get into with that. A couple of questions about that process. You mentioned the different sources, the different ways that we can collect mm -hmm. these stem cells to be infused into the patient. Let's dive into that in terms of the potential sources. And you mentioned apheresis being most common, the peripheral exactly. stem cells. Um, how is that decided and what are the advantages and disadvantages of the different types of collection? Oh, I love talking about this. So <laughs> we'll start with uh, peripheral blood collections. This is performed using an apheresis machine uh, for outpatients and you find a healthy donor uh, to provide um, stem cells for the recipient. You have to find someone who's going to be a good mobilizer if you're doing an allo transplant. So typically sort of bigger guys tend yeah. to be better. I always tell my residents, it's like the movers, they call them the college hunks. The college <laughs> hunks would make great stem cell donors. <laughs> but ultimately, you mobilize them with either GCSF, colony stimulating factor, or plerixifor, a CXCR4 inhibitor. And then those stem cells go in the peripheral blood. We're able to collect them. We quantify them doing a CD34 with flow cytometry. And then we also get the viability and uh, you can infuse those. Mm -hmm. So that's one way to collect them. Or if it's an autologous transplant, unfortunately, a lot of our patients getting an auto transplant are not the college hunks. Mm -hmm. So a little bit different. We may have to be a little bit more aggressive with our mobilization and the amount of collections we do by apheresis. In terms of peripheral blood collections, they tend to engraft pretty quickly, likely because these are already, you know, liquid in the bloodstream already. So they sort of home to the marrow fairly rapidly, which is good because that means they're going to need less transfusion during the peritransplant period. Mm -hmm. 
However, we tend to see a little bit more graft versus host disease in these patients because there's a lot of T cells in the peripheral blood. So that's something to be mindful of. Okay. So after peripheral blood, there's always bone marrow transplantation. And a lot of people will call stem cell transplants bone marrow transplants and sort of use those terms interchangeably, which may or may not be accurate all the time. Right. Bone marrow transplantation, you're actually using an aspiration needle to pull the marrow out of the pelvic bone generally from the posterior superior iliac crest, or you can go anteriorly as well. You're getting a large volume of marrow. And with that, you're going to have everything that comes along with it. You're going to have red cells. You're going to have megakaryocytes, things like that. Mm -hmm. And this tends to take a little bit longer to engraft. However, the graft versus host disease is not as bad because of something in the bony milieu. We don't know why. We know it works, Mm -hmm. but we're not sure why. Unfortunately, people don't like to do this as much as donors. I don't know if you've ever had a bone marrow biopsy performed or done one yourself. Mm -hmm. People don't tend to love the trephine needle. (laughs) That's a fair way to put it. Yes. And, um, that, that's why we use the magic of, of little short acting amnestic drugs when we're doing those procedures. Right. But, yeah. but just to be clear, though, Brian, these are normally in the OR, correct? These are normally in the OR under general anesthesia. They take quite a while and they're they're a physical process having to aspirate for such long t- periods of time. Right. Again, though, there are issues relating to the red cell volume in the graft. Mm. So if you're doing an ABO incompatible transplant, which I think we'll talk about later, yes. you really have to bring down that red cell mass. Got so it. something to keep in mind. Okay. And then core transplant. Core transplant is nice because, as I think we're all aware, the immune environment for a neonate is very different than for an adult, and they don't have a mature immune system. This is why they get passive antibodies from mother during gestation. But it's also why they don't have a back type when they're born, right? They're not making a lot of antibodies. Mm -hmm. So with that, they're a little bit more tolerant of the host tissues and HLAs. So we see less graft versus host disease in cord transplants. Less Uh, than the other two? Less than the other two, yeah. Okay. We can't mobilize these babies, so you Mm. you can't increase your yield at all. And we actually evaluate the yield for a cord transplant differently than peripheral blood or bone marrow. We're just looking at total nucleated cells and we want as many as we can get. Unfortunately, you can't really go back to the source. We can't get more cord to get around that. What we'll often do is we'll use two or even three cords together to help with the engraftment Mm -hmm. because the engraftment type is the longest for cord blood. Mm -hmm. We don't end up seeing patients who are chimeras. Eventually one will win. But Uh, the thought with having multiple grafts is that we're able to better tolerate the engraftment period while the patient's transfusion dependent. Got it. Okay, so if I'm hearing you correctly, what I think I'm hearing is that (laughs) with apheresis, you get faster engraftment than with marrow, but more graft versus host disease. Mm -hmm. With cord, you get slower engraftment than both, but way less graft versus host disease. Is that accurate? That's exactly it. Cool. And just to be clear, the way that the source is chosen is transplanter dependent. In other words, the person yeah, ordering it, the it, transplant that makes that decision. It, it's institutionally dependent generally. Okay. And then there are other things that play a role. Certain malignancies may respond better to bone marrow transplants. Mm. And then also depending on the HLA typing of the patient. In general, stem cell donors tend to be white. However, Anyone can get cancer, right? Anyone can need a stem cell transplant. Unfortunately, we really need to broaden our donor pool and reach out to people of different backgrounds to make more donors available. If that's not really an option, if we can't find an exact HLA match, then we'll probably expand to cord banks and things like Mm -hmm. that to Mm -hmm. try to optimize our chances of finding someone who's going to be HLA compact. Right. And increasing the diversity in the donor pool is a topic that we could talk about for a long yeah. time. But you're <laughs> absolutely right. There's a huge need for that. And and uh, I know that there's a lot of effort going on from that perspective. Mm-hmm. But again, th- that's a topic for another day. But you, I think you mentioned something really important in terms of looking at the match. And obviously, that's huge and crucial. But just to dial it back for our for our learners for just a second, we've got two kind of maybe competing sometimes uh, discussions in terms of matching. You mentioned HLA matching. 
Mm -hmm. Um, Where does ABO matching come into play with that or does it come into play at all? And and how does that compare, for example, if you're going to transplant an organ, like if somebody needs a liver or somebody needs a kidney or whatever? Yeah. Does does matching for for stem cell transplant vary from your priorities from matching for organs? Totally. So for a lot of solid organ transplants, ABO represents a barrier that cannot be crossed. However, in stem cell transplantation, about half, a little less than half of transplants are wow. going to be ABO incompatible. Mm-hmm. The reason for this is because the biggest predictor of graft versus host disease is HLA mismatch. So we typically like to do an eight out of eight match. So HLA A, B, C, and DR. Um, mm-hmm. HLA uh, comes from the MHC on chromosome 6P. ABO mm-hmm. is inherited on chromosome 9, so they're independently inherited. So where we're trying to match for HLA, ABO may or may not be matched. I think the important thing to look for is the outcomes. And the outcomes are actually pretty similar in ABO incompatible mismatch transplant. The main thing to bear in mind is there are going to be some peritransplant issues with regards not only to performance of transfusion, but also pre-transfusion testing and issues that can arise sort of in the immune environment for these patients. Are we seeing any trends in recent years in terms of people being willing to maybe accept a little less HLA identical identicalness? That's not a word. (laughs) But in terms of the way that we're choosing these donors for HLA, are there any or is there anything popping out that's happening more recently? Yeah, so we can do some permissive mismatches, meaning a mismatch that we're okay with Mm -hmm. for certain DP loci, HLA DP, which is one of the class two HLAs. Mm -hmm. And then in addition to that, doing some more haploidentical transplants. Mm -hmm. One way that we're starting to do those more frequently is by doing some T cell depletion of the graft and changing the way that we do immunosuppression and induction for these patients. This is really great because again, it's often challenging to find graft sources for all of these patients with diverse backgrounds. Yeah. So if you can have a haploidentical sibling donate, then that's really fantastic. Okay. Um, to, and let's just make sure that people understand that phrase because that gets tossed out a lot. I had a resident oh, yeah. recently who, when I mentioned haploidentical, was was like, well, that means that's the same as identical, right? No, not at all. So take us through <laughs> that real quickly. <laughs> okay. So humans are diploid. Uh, meaning we have two copies of our chromosomes, and then we have the two sex chromosomes. Ultimately, we inherit haplotypes of HLA from our parents. There's mm-hmm. not really much crossover during ge- or gametogenesis. So with that, you'll get one haplotype from mom and one haplotype from dad. And mom and dad can only pass on their two haplotypes to the kids. So ultimately, the likelihood of having a match is pretty good. If you have enough kids, you probably have a 25 to 100 percent match of having a sibling who has an exact right. um, haplotype oh, gotcha. of yours. Right. You're the chance. The right? more kids, the greater the chance right. of having Understand. the same chromosome sixes. Uh, but ultimately, if you only inherit one that's matched with a sibling, that would be a haploidentical match. OK. OK. So a sibling that in, has inherited uh, basically one half of the same uh, HLA type, can parents be sources for haploidentical too? Yeah. So parents can definitely be sources for haploidentical transplant. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You got half from mom, you got half right. from dad. Dad is favored first because we can make HLA antibodies, right? So we make mm-hmm. HLA antibodies from pregnancy, transplant, and transfusion. So mothers tend to make HLA antibodies at a rate of about 10% per pregnancy. Mm-hmm. So we would prefer to get dad's haplotype because he's less, le- less likely to have HLA antibodies against... Oh, pre-existing HLA yeah, antibodies. pre-existing mean. HLA oh, antibodies. Oh, I see. Okay. okay. Which are not the biggest deal in the world, but sometimes they can lead to some graft issues. Okay. Fair enough. So that's interesting. <laughs> so we are seeing more haploidentical and mm-hmm. allowing that kind of thing. Do we have any data yet on outcomes with haploidentical versus perfect matches? So uh, it's getting better. Initially, I think there was a lot of acute graft rejection and graft versus host disease, now we're starting to see sort of better outcomes for these populations. I see. And just to be clear, if a choice between a perfect sibling match and a haploidentical match, you'd of course, I assume, maybe donor dependent, but you'd prop, you would choose the identical match. Yeah, rather you would than choose the, the identical match. Right. So haploidentical uh, is just another tool in the arsenal to be used if needed. Exactly. Okay. 
All right. So fair enough. So we're, I mean, we're here to talk about transfusion during these situations. So uh-huh. with all of these, is it fair to say that the majority of patients are going to need some sort of transfusion support during their, during the course of their transplant? Nearly 100% of hematopoietic stem cell transplant patients will receive a transfusion during the transplant okay. period. Okay. Does that favor one component or another? Are there, oh, are there things does. that are more likely to be transfused? <laughs> People tend to get platelet transfusions. Someone being a little anemic may or may not be as catastrophic as say, an intracranial hemorrhage, right? Mm. So we often see platelet transfusions. Again, just to be clear, this is because the patient is going through a period after we have either, as you mentioned, totally wiped out their bone marrow or partially wiped out their bone marrow, that they're going to be cytopenic until the transplanted cells start to take over and manufacture cells. Exactly. So generally the engraftment period can last sort of weeks to months. You'll start to see white cells engrafting first, followed by platelets at around like two to three weeks. And then Uh finally you'll be seeing red cells engrafting. Now, this varies based on graft source, total nucleated cells, CD34 counts of the graft, things like that. And I think the key thing to keep in mind is the more cells in the graft, the quicker you're going to see engraftment, which I think makes logical sense. Right. Patients are going to need things like antibiotics to prevent infections. They're going to mm-hmm. need things like platelets to prevent catastrophic hemorrhage. And they're going to need red cells to maintain oxygen carrying capacity. Okay, so let's let's talk through a little bit about some of those choices during transfusion. So we will get to the the ABO mismatch stuff shortly because that's that's essential for for people to understand. But let's just assume for now that we've been able to get a a, a good HLA match, and it just so happens that the ABO matches as well. So oh, wonderful. The recipient is Group A. The donor is Group A. The recipient's Group O. Donor's Group O. Whatever. So in that scenario, let's talk about red cell transfusion first. So are things wildly different in terms of the process of transfusing red cells during this peritransplant period for a a recipient, or are they just the same as normal? Well, the AABB did come out with their (laughs) 2023 guidance on transfusion of red Mm. cells, in which they state that seven grams per deciliter is the appropriate cutoff for transfusion in these hemonc patients. So in that sense, it is very similar, but bearing in mind that we're going to have to maintain the hemoglobin throughout that engraftment period. The lifespan of a red cell is still 120 days. So depending on how long it takes for the patient to engraft, we may or may not need to be transfusing during that period. And there are certain things we can do on the front end if we want to limit transfusion, if Mm -hmm. they have sort of different transfusion needs or preferences, you can use erythroid stimulating agents like EPO, darbapoietin mm. to sort of improve that red cell mass before the transplant. Okay. And then you can certainly optimize any sort of nutritional uh, deficiencies beforehand too. We do try and limit transfusion as much as possible. And again, that's evidence-based. Restrictive transfusions routinely show better outcomes than liberal transfusion strategies. So short answer, The same, still seven. Mm. Long answer, there's some subtleties relating to the transplant process. Okay, okay. In in terms of when we're getting these patients ready for red cell transfusion, in terms of the pre-transfusion testing, are there things that pop up during that pre-transfusion testing process for red cell transfusion that maybe could kind of throw a monkey wrench into the situation? So you've you've got to bear in mind that most of these patients are hemonc patients. So... Hemonc patients are going to get treated with crazy things like monoclonal antibodies. A lot of patients getting autologous transplant have multiple myeloma. So they may have Ooh. a history of being treated with dartumumab, in which case we're going to be matching for Kel or doing DTT treated antibody panels. So that's something to keep in mind. Likewise, these patients have probably been transfused a lot in the past and they may have antibodies against minor red cell antigens like RHKEL, things like that. So matching for that in the transplant period, and then also bearing in mind that they could make antibodies during the transplant. We think a lot about how immunocompromised these patients are, but who, who's it, Murphy? He's got the, he's the one with the law. If it can't happen, it will right. happen. <laughs> <laughs> right. that, that, mur- that pesky murky guy, Murphy guy, Murphy. I know. Darn it. <laughs> 
So listeners, if you're wondering about what Brian was just mentioning about the DARA effect and, and needing to do DTT, I have an entire podcast on that. You can find that in previous, I don't remember the exact number, but you can find discussions on that regarding anti-CD38, as Brian was mentioning. So we won't take the time to go into that. But you did raise something that raises a question in my mind, and it's simply this. Patients that have pre-existing red cell antibodies, is that a consideration when we're looking at matching a donor? Like if somebody has an antibody against the big K or the Duffy A or something like that, do we worry about that with the blood, with the transplant donors? So this is a scenario where we're optimally matching HLA. Mm -hmm. We are not going to necessarily exclude a donor if there's an antibody there, even if it's a donor specific antibody. When these transplants do happen, and I think the best data is in sickle cell disease population, Mm -hmm. there tends to be an increased red cell transfusion burden. And there is obviously risk for engraftment type issues, but it's something that would not preclude us from doing the transplant. Okay. And would that be true also for RH? In other words, if you have an RH negative recipient, can you transplant an RH positive donor? Yeah. And you can even make RH antibodies after that. They wouldn't likely be long standing just because eventually the blood is going to all be RH positive. We see kooky stuff during (laughs) transplant. And I think the kookiest thing is that, you know, Everything in the blood bank says never get rid of an antibody. You know, we always have to honor it. But these antibodies can disappear with transplant, which is wild. (laughs) That Yeah. And which leads to, I'm sure, interesting discussions with your transfusion staff, because as you said, they're trained to hear things like uh, once an antibody, always an antibody. And all of a sudden you're talking about somebody with an entirely different immune Immune milieu. Yeah, that's wild. Yes. Okay. I can see how that could lead to interesting discussions. Interesting discussions. (laughs) Okay. So we've talked about for red cells that, that in general with red cells, the thresholds are similar to just patients that are not undergoing stem cell transplant. As you said, ABB put out those recommendations, those guidelines, I should say in, in late 2023. And those will be referenced by the way, everybody in the show notes for this, for this particular episode. Let's talk about platelets. Mm -hmm. Platelets, obviously, as you mentioned, are something that that patients tend to almost always need. So any any particular discussion on platelets uh, and thresholds and guidelines and and debates, if there are any, about when to give platelets to these patients? So platelet transfusion tends to be an issue because platelets are short lived and the supply is often low. Platelets aren't going to last that long. It's more around like 10-ish days. Mm -hmm. After we do the induction chemotherapy, whatever that looks like, these platelets will not be lasting through to engraftment. That's why ultimately we generally need a platelet transfusion for these patients. And the question really comes, should we be transfusing based on a threshold or based on symptomatic bleeding? And really it varies based on the population. Mm. I think the safest threshold to use is 10,000. If you're under 10,000, no one would ever fault you for doing a platelet transfusion. Right. However, it does appear that in patients with conditions like AML, they are going to really need that 10K cutoff to be honored. In patients undergoing autologous transplant for multiple myeloma, a symptomatic transfusion down to 5K may be appropriate. Mm-hmm. But again, that's a case-by-case basis, and you really need to be careful with these patients. The reality of practice is we don't always have the platelets. So leaning on the literature that shows that autologous transplant patients can sometimes tolerate these lower counts and transfusing for symptomatic bleeding is something to bear in mind. Okay. And in this population, I'm assuming that similar arguments occur or similar discussions occur when we're talking about doing things like central venous catheter placement or lumbar puncture or, Mm. God forbid, operative procedures, which... Obviously, we would want to avoid if we could, but it sometimes become Things inevitable. Things happen, right? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. It, basically, you have to take a look for all these different thresholds. You can generally rely on sort of lower thresholds for lumbar punctures and things like that. The greater the intervention, the more cutting involved in the surgery, the higher the yeah. threshold. And then, again, if a patient has a fever, mm-hmm. tending to keep the count closer to 20, something like that. Okay. So what you're telling me sounds similar to what we deal with in non-transplant patients, the debates and discussions are kind of along similar lines. Is that accurate? Definitely. I I would say the only difference here is that I know we're going to need to transfuse this patient at some Mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. And it's really just a matter of time before it happens. Right. 
So the way we do rounds down here, we talk about all the calls that happen overnight. All the faculty get on a big Teams call. And sometimes I'm following a patient throughout the week and I'm thinking, okay, today's the day. They Uh, get the platelet uh transfusion. We held off long enough. (laughs) Yes, I understand. Now, something I haven't mentioned yet, Brian, and but we haven't really talked about pediatric transplant population. Mm-hmm. So I, we're, we're primarily focusing on adult just because that's where we're seeing most of these. But obviously, there is a big group of little people that are getting these transplants <laughs> as well. Do these debates for thresholds in platelet transfusion and red cell transfusion, are they similar in the pediatric population or do you have information on that? So I will out myself as a pediatric transfusion medicine person. My (laughs) main job is at the children's hospital. Right. I would say in children, we tend to stick more closely to that 10,000 threshold Mm -hmm. uh, for platelet transfusions as opposed to waiting for like symptomatic uh, management. Mm -hmm. And then with red cells, it's still the seven grams per deciliter. Okay. Is there as much good data on pediatric transfusions as it is for adults? And I will acknowledge that I wish the data was stronger in adults, Mm. but how is it for peds? I think that's an area of active interest. (laughs) (laughs) That is a very diplomatic way of putting that. The topic of platelet refractoriness or someone not responding well to a platelet transfusion is a very large one in general in in transfusion medicine, of Mm. course. The topic of this during and after transplant, I'm sure, is is an even bigger potential problem. So mm-hmm. what can you tell us just as a, an overview about platelet refractoriness and how we deal with it? So platelet refractoriness is a huge problem for the transfusion medicine community. Um, in preparation for transplants where patients are really HLA sensitized, that's something you really have to keep in mind. So yeah. you, you're going to need a plan in place if you have donors um, who are good matches um, for platelets, having those sort of scheduled out is a reasonable thing. Oftentimes you're figuring this out on the back end. Nobody knew there was an HLA antibody problem. Mm. <laughs> and now it's like, oh my goodness, we have to find compatible platelets. Right. On the pre-transplant side, there's a lot you can do. You can desensitize either by doing plasma exchange or plasma cell type therapies like DARA, things like mm. that to basically plasma cell deplete the patient and antibody deplete them prior to the transplant. Just to be, you're saying this is, if you know they have HLA antibodies if, before if the transplant. If you know they're HLA sensitized, you can desensitize them prior to the transplant. Okay. And that can help you in terms of providing platelet transfusion. Mm-hmm. Obviously, I think the best thing you can do is have platelets available that are going to be HLA matched. And then if you don't have either of those, then you're sort of on the back end using pooled platelets, attempting like platelet drips, or just giving off the shelf for symptomatic bleeds. It is a really difficult thing. One intervention that I really like is the use of antifibrinolytics for mucosal type bleeds. Mm -hmm. So if someone does have epistaxis or gum bleeding, you can do TXA nasal spray or TXA swish and spit, and you can limit some of that mucosal bleeding. It's an antifibrinolytic, the lysine analog, that's going to block that breakdown of fibrin. So that's really good because it's not really prothrombotic. It more maintains clots that are there. So that's something you can do as an intervention. If a a person is really platelet refractory, Mm -hmm. um, you can offer that. Unfortunately, the data on TXA and preventing head bleeds in patients Mm -hmm. with severe thrombocytopenia uh, doesn't really show much efficacy. So in other words, what you're saying is it stinks just like it does in patients that aren't transplant yeah. patient. It, it's challenging. It stinks and you know you're going to have to give them a platelet transfusion. Right. Well, bef- before I talk about <laughs> some of the modifications that we might want to make to red cell and platelet transfusions, I, I just want to make sure that we mention the possibility of, com- of transfusion of other components. You guys Plasma- say the G word? Uh, pl- well, I'll start <laughs> with saying plasma and cryoprecipitate, <laughs> for example, but also the G word, the granulocytes. <laughs> Okay, so in terms of safety with blood products, obviously we're living in an era where pathogen reduction technology is available. Mm -hmm. So they're developing this for red cells. It's been developed and is widely implemented for platelets. And then plasma products, if these patients do require plasma products, we do have uh, pathogen reduced Mm -hmm. preparations available. Thinking about things like that is always an option, although off the shelf, frozen uh, units should be fine. Sure. Likewise with cryo, I, I love cryo, but mm-hmm. if fibrinogen is low, you can do fibrinogen concentrates yep. or you can also do cryo or you can do the PR cryo. 
right. pathogen reduced cryo. But less often dealing with plasma and, and cryotransfusions by far yeah. than red cells and platelets. Uh, you you can have some liver issues uh, during mm-hmm. like the induction uh, process and in the um, engraftment period. Yep. And that's generally related to the patient's underlying liver function. Right. And also always making sure that your patient's vitamin K replete. Well, what about grannies? We got to talk about grannies for just a second. Granulocytes. <laughs> 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 so granulocytes are difficult to deal with. Mm-hmm. Granulocytes are typically collected from our regular platelet donors because we're not able to do infectious disease testing in time uh, before they release because they only have a shelf life of 24 hours. Mm-hmm. They have to be ABO compatible. They have to be matched for CMV. And they also have to be irradiated because these patients yeah. are at high risk for graft versus host disease, transfusion associated. <laughs> so anyways, do they work? I don't know. I think the jury's still out on that. A lot has been yes. said about granulocytes and their efficacy. I think the best chance at a granulocyte working is if it's a high dose. And ultimately, we tend not to use granulocytes until an infection is already refractory. I think there might be a world where they could work sort of earlier on, but no one would ever use them like that because you would just use antimicrobial therapy. I, I think if you did a large enough study with high enough doses of granulocytes, it would probably work. But I can't control how someone mobilizes their granulocytes. Yeah. And I, I can't get more donors. So And good luck randomizing the patients, Brian. Yeah. I mean, and that was the struggle. <laughs> I mean, I've been around a little bit longer than you have. And I remember during the, the so-called ring study. Yeah where we had people that were like, I don't want my patient randomized because I don't want them getting granulocytes. And other clinicians, I don't want my patients randomized because I don't believe in granulocytes. So it mm-hmm. was just a disaster. But as you said, the the one bit of data that I think that we got from what we did do with Ring mm-hmm. was that the higher the number of granulocytes, the better chance of them working. Yeah. And I think if you read some stuff from the Pittsburgh group, they're mm-hmm. doing really great things in terms of mobilizing their donors. I think if you can do that and you have a smaller patient, then you probably stand a better chance of them working. But I can't guarantee they're going to work. And I've also seen patients who've gotten granulocytes for months and Mm -hmm. still have persistent fungal infections. Granulocytes for months. My former my life as a former (laughs) blood center medical director is is flashing before my eyes and thinking of doing that for months because it is. This is one thing, by the way, Brian, that is not as widely appreciated as I think it should be. When granulocytes are ordered on the blood donor center side, it is a lot of work. I mean, oh, yeah. it is hard for the, it's hard to arrange the donors and you have to do it. And when you have to do it every day and you're going through your recent apheresis platelet donors because of the infectious disease testing issue. And then further, if you throw in, oh, by the way, this patient has an anti-Big K or an anti duffy A and, mm-hmm. uh, and you got to match, you got to find donors that are negative for those. And bear in mind too, these are... Uh, units that contain a lot of red cells. When you yes. see the units, they look pretty red. So people can alloimmunize from getting granulocytes. No question. Not yeah. only red cell antigens, but also HLA antigens. Yeah. So that's going to affect your platelet yields. Mm-hmm. So it, it, I think the best advice I can give is if you're in a situation where you have to give granulocytes, I think there's a point where it doesn't make as much of an impact. Anyways, that's what I found from transplanters I've talked to about this. Yeah. Because sometimes... You are in a situation where you have to give granulocytes. Let's talk about modifications to routine transfusion. And we, we, we've got to deal with things on two counts, I, I believe, at, at minimum. First, we have to discuss CMV, mm-hmm. how we prevent CMV in at-risk recipients. And then second, the transfusion-associated graft versus host disease. We've kind of talked about them a little bit, but just if you can take those two issues on for Definitely. Me. So... In terms of product modification, those are the two big things. We're worried about mm-hmm. CMV transmission. We're worried about transfusion-associated graft-versus-host disease. So let's start with CMV. Historically, stem cell transplant patients would be receiving CMV-negative units or blood from CMV-negative donors. However, it's important to bear in mind that people donating blood don't typically have active CMV infections. And with that, you're really looking for an antibody to CMV. Mm-hmm. CMV does live latently in white cells, monocytes specifically. So if we can get rid of those monocytes prior to transfusion, theoretically, that would reduce the risk of CMV. And mm-hmm. in practice, that's actually what happens. So they did a big study where they compared CMV negative with leukocyte reduced and discovered that there was really no significant incidence of CMV. 
And with that, that's really the way that the field has moved, calling leukocyte reduced blood CMV safe. And mm-hmm. that that holds true for other populations like neonates, even seeing this in like intrauterine transfusion, things like that. People right. who are at the highest risk for CMV getting LR only blood and that being sufficient. Occasionally, if you get somebody who's kind of old school, they might be asking for CMV status on their units. And with that, you can sort of counsel them and say that leukocyte reduced is probably equivalent. Mm-hmm. And we call it CMV safe. And then GVHD, transfusion associated GVHD, something that is often on my mind as a pediatric blood banker. Yeah. The way that that's ultimately prevented is by irradiating the blood product. So T cells in the transfusion come along and then they can produce a graft versus host disease. This is different than the transplant associated graft versus host disease, Mm -hmm. because in the transplant, you've got stem cells that are going to re-engraft the marrow. Here, you just have mature T cells that are going to attack the host. Mm -hmm. Um, So this would be a huge problem. And when you see transfusion associated graft versus host, which thank goodness I've never seen outside of a paper. Where's wood? I got to knock on wood somewhere to, for, for your luck to continue. Yes. It, basically, they have to have an emergency transplant um, mm-hmm. and the mortality is super high. So yep. ha- have to be very uh, conservative with this uh, in terms of irradiating products or doing anything that can in- inactivate those T cells. So if we look at our pathogen reduction technologies by using the sorolin, which is going to intercalate with nucleic acids with the UV light, That Mm -hmm. will also inactivate T cells, not necessarily having to irradiate platelets that are PR treated. So that's that can be really helpful in services, especially where they do a lot of irradiation, not having to irradiate the PR platelets. All right. That is super helpful. But as I mentioned at the beginning, Brian, we've got to get to ABO incompatible because I do get a lot (laughs) of questions about that. And especially from poor young pathology residents who are getting ready to take standardized examinations and they know they're going to get faced with something (laughs) that they need to think about a massive chart. And in your article that I mentioned before we started this discussion, you guys have at the end a massive chart. We have the chart. You have the chart. Everybody has the chart (laughs) and the chart is painful. Yeah, I know you know that. It's I'm not telling you anything that you don't already know. You mentioned before roughly half of transplants nowadays are ABO incompatible where the Mm -hmm. donor and the recipient are not ABO identical. So if you would take us through the different types of incompatibility, and then we'll talk about how to manage those. Definitely. All right. So there's three types that we think about, and they're based on the risk of acute hemolysis. If you're putting in incompatible red cells, that would be a major incompatibility. If you're infusing incompatible plasma, that's a minor Mm -hmm. incompatibility. And you can think about that. We go out of group on platelets all the time. And if it's both, then it's bidirectional. So let's sort of zoom in on that and think about it. So if we're infusing incompatible red cells, that would mean that's like an A to an O individual. So an A donor and an O recipient. If there's red cells in the graft, then they will be rapidly coated by IgM antibodies and there will be intravascular hemolysis. Mm -hmm. We get around that by reducing the amount of red cells in the graft. Short story. Minor incompatibility, you're infusing incompatible antibodies. So... There's plasma in the graft that will then distribute throughout the body, not really getting to a level where it's going to lyse any red cells. Mm-hmm. And then in bidirectional, you've got problems with both. So you really need to both plasma reduce and uh, red cell reduce the graft or eliminate antibodies from the recipient mm-hmm. as well to try and prevent both hemolysis related to antibodies and related to red cells. But bidirectional <laughs> is only, it's pretty limited in terms of the 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 donor relation, A to right? B or B to A. Yeah, that's it. And that um, is, I will say, the least frequent ABO incompatible transplant. That, right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let, let's zoom back in on that major incompatibility when, mm-hmm. as you said, we're, for example, we're transplanting a group A uh, donor into a group O recipient. So those pre-existing antibodies in the recipient could hammer those red cells cells. that are coming in. So you talked about the possibility of an immediate problem. Mm -hmm. Are there any more delayed problems that can come up as a result of that incompatibility? Oh, great question. So again, we are worried about the immediate hemolysis. So we want a red cell reduce the graft. If it's peripheral blood, there shouldn't be too many red cells in there. Mm -hmm. If it's a bone marrow graft, there's a lot of red cells that you have to get rid of. 
Right. Uh, so you can actually run that through like an apheresis machine again to pull mm. off all those red cells. Ultimately, once it is infused, those erythroid precursors are going to have to engraft, right? Guess what? You have all these plasma cells that want to spit out isohemagglutinins to land on those red cell precursors. The recipients, plasma cells that are still hanging around, right? Exactly. Uh-huh. I always say plasma cells are like cockroaches. So anyways, we can see delayed engraftment in these patients, okay. specifically of red cells. So you'll mm-hmm. have engraftment of your platelets and your white cells, and you'll have delayed red cell engraftment. With that, you can get something called pure red cell aplasia, wherein you'll do a bone marrow biopsy, you'll have megakaryopoiesis, you'll have myelopoiesis, and you'll have absent erythropoiesis, almost like if someone had like a parvo infection. So that's really difficult to deal with. And these patients will need immunosuppression on the back end to try and get around that. Is that permanent? So it depends. Sometimes Mm. we can get around it with immunosuppression. Other times the patients may have failure and require a second transplant. That's the, that doesn't sound like a good That's not good. And no. that, that's something to bear in mind. However, we tend not to see pure red right. cell aplasia. If we do see it, it's with A donors to O recipients. That's okay. the most common. But the hope is ultimately those plasma cells are going to go away, Brian? That- yeah. This is also mm-hmm. something if we have the really intensive chemotherapy prior to transplant, mm-hmm. you're going to see less of those plasma cells sticking around. That Whereas if sense. we do reduced intensity chemotherapy, you're more likely to have some of those residual immune effector cells. Okay. All right. So those are the major complications in major complications in, <laughs> in the major, major incompatibility. Yeah, incompatibility. That, that was perfect. unintentional, but whatever. <laughs> now, what about in the minor, the minor incompatibility? You mentioned in the initial concern was the, the incoming plasma. Again, the, mm-hmm. the classic example is the group O donor, the group A recipient. So the group O donor, there's plasma coming along with that. It has anti-A, so it could, in theory, hammer those recipients' red cells. Again, that's the immediate complication. Let's talk a little bit about how we get around that, but further, any delayed complications as well. Definitely, definitely. So the first thing first is we're going to plasma reduce the graft. So whenever you're in this cell therapy lab, you're spinning Mm -hmm. your progenitor cells, and then you're expressing off that plasma. So you want to get the plasma out of the graft as best you can. But ultimately, and I'm sure that a lot of your listeners are saying, well, we give out-of-group platelets all the time. Is a little Mm -hmm. bit of incompatible plasma okay? It actually is. According to most people. According to most people. We don't have Neil Blumberg on this discussion. I'm I'm sorry, Neil. No no offense, Neil. We love you. He follows me on Twitter. He seems so cool. (laughs) The antibodies have to reach basically a critical threshold on the red cell surface in order to activate complement. And whenever you're putting a small amount of plasma into a five liter blood volume adult, all of that plasma is going to distribute. So yeah. you're not really going to see acute hemolysis, but you will get a situation called passenger lymphocyte syndrome. Mm-hmm. So herein you have white cells in the graft that can elaborate these anti-red cell antibodies, usually around seven to 10 days after mm-hmm. uh, infusion of the graft. And typically these are against like the ABO antibod or ABO antigens if it's an ABO incompatible transplant. So what you'll see is a positive DAT, a little bit of a drop in hemoglobin, and this is generally transient, but that's the passenger Mm -hmm. lymphocyte syndrome. So again, these are thus the name. These are lymphocytes that are coming along with the transplant that are popping out ABO antibodies that are incompatible with the recipient's red cells. Exactly. Got it. And this is also interesting in that these antibodies tend not to be longstanding. So Mm -hmm. in general, uh, this is where we see the ABO typing discrepancies in minor Mm -hmm. transplants Mm -hmm. is eventually uh, these antibodies will go away and you'll have the forward type of the donor, uh, but the back type uh, will be missing those um, anti-recipient antibodies, which is really interesting. Fair to say that in these ABO incompatible transplants, that it leads to discussions between medical directors of transfusion services and transfusion staff to determine oh my gosh, what do we call this person ABO-wise and how do we transfuse them? Is that fair? (laughs) Yes. Um, So we use a type not determined in our Mm. blood bank. Ultimately, people will switch the type in the LIS generally after it's been that way, either after a time period after transplantation or after Mm -hmm. you have two to three types that match the donor type or recipient type if they don't have engraftment. And then you'll just switch. 
ultimately you'll match for the forward blood type, though, in these patients. Okay. And there are instances where the old blood type has been honored, where there's been some sort of catastrophic event where the patient gets the wrong blood, something like mm. that. And uh, it's interesting because it can induce those antibodies to oh be made. But that that's atypical. But, you know, immunohematology, it's crazy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Brian. So the, the residents listening to this are like, would you get to the chart? OK, I'll get to the chart. So you're presented with a case either on in the real world or the exam world. And mm-hmm. you know that there's one of these incompatibilities. And yes, you have the chart, but is there any way that we can kind of shortcut the chart and at least figure out without having memorized every detail of it, which is mm-hmm. impossible, how do we transfuse someone who's getting a, a major, and specifically we're talking about red cell and platelet tra- uh, transfusion primarily, mm-hmm. how do we make those choices in those major and minor and bidirectional incompatibilities? So you want whatever you're transfusing to be as compatible as possible with both the immune milieu and the red cells that the recipient has. So you would honor sort of in order of where you're at in the transplant process, right? I think the easiest thing to say is give O red cells, give AB plasma or AB platelets. But you can certainly switch once someone's engrafted. But that's typically where I start is giving O red cells and then plasma products or platelet products. uh, You have a little bit more leeway in terms of Mm -hmm. out of group units. Okay. Well, I mean, that's that that makes it pretty simple. But Brian, when I look at your chart, it doesn't always say group O red cells, dude. (laughs) I mean, I'm looking at it right now and it does not always say that. So, you know, I'm I'm sorry, I'm not not meaning to be a a pain in the butt, but this is this is challenging to to learners. It yeah. definitely is. So when you're teaching your residents, do you tell them to go to the chart? Do you do you talk through it in terms of just kind of trying out possibilities? So typically before the transplant, you're honoring whatever the recipient is at that time. Mm-hmm. And during the initial part of the engraftment, you would prefer to give O red cells. And until engraftment occurs, you're generally using something that's compatible with both as best you can. It, it is tough. And typically I do have people go to the chart. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the the lightest ink is better than the best memory sometimes. Well, that's probably true. <laughs> what you've already told us is really important. If it's on an exam, you're going to get a list of possibilities. You have to think logically. You have to think what's going to be most compatible that's going to cause the least amount of problems for this particular recipient that would lead to the, the least likelihood of hemolysis, right? Yeah. Is that a fair way to put it? Exactly. Yeah. And really, you're matching the uh, you're matching the red cells by just doing O most of the time, mm-hmm. unless you're really hard pressed. It, it's more the plasma containing products where you have yeah. a little more leeway. That's true. And and it's as as you know, in the real world, it's easy to say, hey, we'll just give them AB platelets or plasma. And, and that's not an that's not a never ending source. Exactly. Right? <laughs> that's not yeah. that is always the least common blood donor. And that that can be challenging. So you, you do have to kind of work through that and figure it out. So I think with plasma and platelet products, yes. trying to honor the recipient prior to transplant, honoring the donor after transplant, because Got that's it. really going to be the immune system that's there. Mm -hmm. And then with red cells, bearing in mind that if you have 50 mLs of incompatible red blood cells, that can be fatal. I guess my best advice to residents is spend a little time with Brian's chart and try things out. You know, quiz yourself, basically. Try because the answers are right there. And you guys have this chart. There are numerous. Claudia Cohn did one. Pat Kopko did one a few years ago. You guys did one in a previous publication as well. Mm -hmm. So that information is out there. Try it out. Use your brain. Be logical about it. And I think you'll get to a good place. So, Brian, we have we've spent a while kind of running through all this stuff. There's a lot of information here and, and a lot of great, great info that you've shared with us. Do you have any you have any last thoughts before we let you go? I would just say reach out if you have questions during the transplant period. We're all just doing our best. I'm only the blood banker. I'm not the transplanter. So I often lean on my transplant colleagues if I have questions about the induction, about sort of how things are going on the other side or just sort of general questions. Mm -hmm. And you can always ask up front. It's much easier to do things in preparation than it is on the back end. 
planning for these things is really important. And I completely agree with that. And I think you say something that's really important. And if there are are any learners or future transfusion medicine docs or even people that already are transfusion medicine docs, I think what you just said, Brian, is so important. Transfusion medicine is not meant to be practiced in a vacuum. We are not just in the laboratory. And it's why I get a little nuts when people call people that order transfusions clinicians and call pathologists non-clinicians. We're clinicians. We need to be involved in this discussion. The more we're part of the team that's helping take care of the patient. I'm, I'm on a soapbox now, Brian. The more we're the more we're on a team helping to take care of the patients and the more we're seen that way, the more input we can have and the better the patient care. I, I feel really, really passionately about that. And um, thanks for letting me soapbox it for a second. Oh, yeah. Tra- Transfusion is the most common procedure in the hospital. It affects a lot of patients. So it, the I think the more input you can give, because as a pathologist, you are a subject matter expert relative to a lot of your colleagues. So being proud about that and mm-hmm. using that knowledge for good, like a real like blood superhero. I like this. <laughs> I like the soapbox. This is good. It's a good soapbox. I like it. I I tend to climb on it quite a bit. All right, my friend, thank you so much for being with me. Thank you so much for sharing all your thoughts. I, I greatly look forward to seeing you in person, hopefully real soon. Yeah. Take care. Thanks, Joe. My huge thanks to Dr. Adkins for hanging out with me and for illuminating all of us with such really practical and useful information. I learned a lot doing this interview, and I hope you did too. I truly hope that this will be the start of a new season for the Blood Bank Guy Essentials podcast, that we won't have any gaps like we had last time, but I've learned enough in life to know that there are no guarantees. So moving forward, I have some things planned, and I hope that I will see you again very, very soon. Before I go, I'd like to remind you for this episode to please go to bbguide.org slash 104 and download the really excellent article that Brian and his co-authors wrote regarding the topics that we talked about today. In addition, I would love it if you could go to Apple Podcasts to subscribe, rate, and review this particular podcast so that others can find it. Uh, I know it's been a while, but I do read every single review that's on there, and I appreciate all of you that have taken the time to do that. So until the next time we see each other, which I hope will be a very short time, my friends, I hope that you smile, have fun, and above all, never, ever stop learning. Thank you so much for listening today. We'll catch you next time on the Blood Bank Guy Essentials Podcast. 